My name is Nadine McNeil, otherwise known as Universal Empress, Jamaican by birth, Universal in outlook. I was born in Jamaica, as I said. I left Jamaica when I was 16. Between zero and 16, I lived in Kingston. I was born in Kingston, not all hospital. Went to St. Jude's Prep, and from there I went to Wilmers. I'm proud to be a Wilmerian, I did quite a case. And I left Jamaica initially to go to Canada. I was in Toronto for about three years. I did grade 13 there and a few university years. Then, following the death of my grandmother, who I was very close to, I returned to Jamaica. I was in Jamaica for about nine months, during which time I ran a catering business. There are not many people who actually know that. And um, I did desserts and orders. For me to name the places where I worked, I'd be dating myself, so I won't do that. And then I left Jamaica when my mother went to live in New York, and I joined her in New York, and I started to work with the UN. Oh. Well, let us put it this way. When Shannon's Rhythm, I'm a Jamaican in New York, was big, I was living in New York. I was blessed to live in New York in my 20s, and I had the best time. I mean, New York was rough and ready at the time, but it was also incredibly real. I am super, super grateful for the foundation I got in New York because going to school in Jamaica and being educated on a system based on, you know, the British system, there were certain things I didn't learn. So, you know, when I went to live in New York, I became aware of people like Miriam Makiba and Malcolm X and James Baldwin and Alice Walker and John Coltrane. I mean, it was just an extraordinary time to be in New York City, hanging out in Harlem. Reggae music was large and has always been, you know. I, I remember the times of hanging out at Reggae Lounge in the West Village. I remember, you know, going to a nightclub when it was 25 US dollars to get into area. You know, Andy Warhol was still around in those days. That was the era of the emerging of black, where everything, everyone was dressed in black from head to toe. And you know, at that stage of the game, we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a great time. Um, one of my dear friends, we often laugh, we used to save our soda bottles and sell them so that we could have enough money to get into the clubs on the weekend because that was the priority. So New York was great. New York is still home away from home for me. I have been blessed to live in a lot of places, but it is an extraordinary city. It's become a little gentrified in the last decade or so, but just in terms of a set of people that keep it real, a place with an edge, there's no city to me like New York City. You know, Steve Jobs talks about connecting the dots, and one of my mentors who lives in Jamaica often says, if we knew how life would turn out, we'd probably not live it. Um, I joined the UN in 1986 as a messenger, the lowest rung, and I'm very grateful for that because in fact, as a result of joining the UN at that level, I got to meet a lot of the big wigs then, people like Kofi Annan, Angela King, may her soul rest in peace, um, so many people that I could, Perez de Cuella, the Secretary General at that point in time, because I had to go to work very early in the morning to make sure that my UN career took off, as it were, following Operation Desert Storm, the Iraq-Kuwaiti War, and that was my first overseas assignment. Uh, went to Kuwait, lived on the Iraqi-Kuwaiti border, a place called Mikasa. And I spent about seven and a half years in the Middle East working between peacekeeping and disarmament. Left the Middle East and then went to live in Europe. I was in the Netherlands for about eight years, in fact. It's the longest time I've ever lived anywhere in one spell outside of Jamaica, working for the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. And then, you know, those of us who have been in the field, that bug never quite leaves you. So in around 2005, I believe, I left the middle, I left Europe and I went to live in Sudan. Sudan took me to Indonesia decided to take a break from the UN for a little while. This is all while my yoga path was deepening. So following my time here in Indonesia, after the tsunami, I went off to New Zealand and India, did a bit of volunteer work, did some yoga immersion, spent some time in an ashram. 
And then from there, I was in Jamaica actually for about two years. And <laughs> Jamaica is always an interesting place for me because of course, like anyone who has lived away for a long period of time, there's an aspect of the place that I'm deeply connected to. And there's an aspect of the place where I feel as foreign as everyone else or every foreigner visiting, shall I say. So I left Jamaica and I went to work on Haiti uh, following the earthquake in 2009. And I was in Haiti for nine months when one of my former UN bosses invited me to come to the Central African Republic, then the fourth poorest country in the world, uh, head of their operations there. And I was there for just under two years. And um, yeah, that was an assignment and then some. There's so much, much I could say about that. But I mean, I know myself to be a strong person. Central Africa showed me levels of myself I didn't even know existed. I then left Central Africa and decided to return to Jamaica because my mother was not well at that point. And um, yeah, so that was that. All my life, I've been involved in some sort of fitness. When I wasn't at the gym, I was running. When I wasn't running, I was jumping. I've always been a very physical person. And interestingly enough, I went to Pilates before I went to yoga. I was living in the Netherlands and I started to get bored at the gym. And a friend of mine said to me, well, why don't you try some yoga? So off I went to a yoga class one day and I have to tell you about the first few or so I actually didn't like it. But I'm very good at doing things I don't like. So I persevered as it were. And then when I left the Netherlands to go and live in Sudan, yoga was the one thing I could take with me. I could roll out a mat and I could drop into an asana practice. So then my practice started to deepen. And then once I came to Indonesia, a stone's throw, I was based in Jakarta, stone's throw from Bali, where I'd come to Bali for R&R, &R, I practiced even more. And in 2008, I knew I wanted to learn more about this thing that I was doing that was having a deeply profound impact on me. I remember saying to Sharon Fiani, owner of Shakti Mind Body Fitness in Jamaica at the time, I said to her, you know, I think I want to do a teacher training. So off I went to India. In fact, I correct that, and it's important I correct that. I said to her, I would like to deepen my knowledge of yoga. And then as it remains now, the only way to do that was really to go and do a teacher training. I knew I wanted to deepen my knowledge and I knew I wanted to do it in India. Those were the two things that were very clear to me. And so when I went off to India, I was at the Shivananda Ashram in Southern India for about two and a half months. And upon completion of my teacher training, I remember as the Swami handed me the diploma, he looked at me and he says to me, you must start teaching immediately. And I was stunned because I thought he must have been speaking to someone else. Following the training, I returned to Jamaica and um, speaking to Sharon on the phone. And she says, oh, you must come to Shakti and teach. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. So anyway, off I went and I started to teach. And, you know, anything we practice, we get good at. And so the more I taught, I started to really enjoy it. And what I love about teaching yoga, it doesn't matter how many classes I teach. It's the one time where I'm completely present. I'm not all over the place. And in that moment, there's nothing greater. So I then taught and did my UN work side by side. My UN platform was growing. My visibility was growing. I was doing a lot of karma work, service work with yoga. I remember returning to Jamaica, doing some work with Art of Living, where I took yoga into places like General Penitentiary, Spanish Town Prison. I remember, you know, going into orphanages, going into places like August Town, working with the Turnaround Project out of Canada that ran a program between Portland and August Town. And it was while I was in Central Africa and teaching in Central Africa, I realized that I was getting to a point where I had straddled myself so thin, I needed to make a choice. So with a huge dose of faith and a little bit of insanity, 
I decided to step completely into the yoga world and that was kind of how it began. I started to grow my antennas, my covenant as it were, in 2002, January 1st, 2002. I remember making a conscious decision that I was going to grow my hair. And Universal Empress was born maybe about eight years later or nine years later. And there's so many ways to look at that. But you know, in Jamaica, Empress, you have locks, you wear the covenant, you wear the title of Empress. And there's a responsibility that comes with that title. And you know, given my sort of globe trotting as it were, my friends tease me and tell me I don't have a fixed address. I thought when Universal Empress was befitting and it somehow kind of just worked and you know, the brand has grown. And I tell you something about names, as I often say to my students and peers, words sound power. Because when I chose that name, I had no idea what I was taking on and what I would grow into. My first trip to Bali, interestingly enough, was around 1992 with a boyfriend. Um, and I often laugh about that because I remember in those days, I think the hotel we stayed at was the Intercontinental in Nusa Dua. And I remember being by the pool and one of the staff walked by and said to me, be very careful of the sun and lying out in the sun you'll get sunburned and I kind of looked at him and I said what are you doing I'm Jamaican you know I can handle sun well let me tell you I have never been sunburned before or since as I was then fast forward to 2005 2006 when I returned to work with UNICEF following the tsunami on Boxing Day 2004 and so what would happen is based in Jakarta I traveled around Java spent a lot of time traveling around Indonesia Bali was the place that I came for R&R. &R. And I remember being here one weekend for a fundraiser for an NGO called Bumi Sehat, run by an incredible woman by the name of Robin Lynn. And um, a dear friend of mine and sister, Megan Pappenheim, we were at this fundraiser event and whoever was supposed to MC the event didn't show up. And all I remember to this day is this woman with this crazy head of red hair and these gorgeous green eyes kind of rolling up to me with her New York accent and saying to me, uh, would you mind emceeing this show because whoever was supposed to do it hasn't shown up. And I kind of looked at this woman and I said to her, I heard myself say to her, all right, what do I need to do? And the rest is history. 15 years or however many years later, we're both still crazy, love each other and travel the world, having tons of fun. So, after leaving the UN, I would come to Bali for about three months of the year. I have been involved with the Bali Spirit Festival from the very beginning. I'm the Bali Spirit Festival ambassador. I've been a director for this festival. And every year that I would come and spend about three months, at the end of those three months, my beloved friend Megan would say to me, so when are you moving to Bali? And I'd laugh and I'd say to her next year. Anyway, 2014 or 2015, it was 2014, following the festival, she says to me, so when are you moving? I says, I'm coming later on this year. She says, are you serious? I said, yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, she then came to Jamaica that summer. I guess she wanted to be sure that I was really coming. And I decided to move here and make this home. Um, if you're in the world of yoga, there's no greater place to be. The Yoga Barn is the largest yoga wellness facility in Southeast Asia. I call it the United Nations of Yoga. Everybody who is into yoga, wellness, spirituality, dance, movement, you name it, comes to Yoga Barn at some stage of the game. Indonesians and ba the Balinese love Jamaicans. They love reggae music. It's a natural fit. I feel very comfortable here. And, um, you know, Bali is to the East Indies what Jamaica was to the West Indies. And when you understand history, understand the spice trade, even the flowers, the food, a lot of it is very, very similar. If Bali is a place that calls you come, Bali invites people. It's not just an island that opens up itself, but the same way Jamaica stays. You either vibe with it or you don't. Everywhere that I have been in the world and people ask me where I'm from and I say Jamaica, the response is humbling as it is overwhelming. 
As a nation, we are tremendously respected. I often say we're either feared or revered. Everyone wants to be Jamaican. It's cool to be Jamaican. If you think about it from a humanitarian revolutionary standpoint, there is not a revolution on this planet or evolution that has not involved reggae music or Jamaica at some point. You know, the obvious person we think about is Bob. You know, the places that move Bob deeply, New Zealand, Zimbabwe, places that have moved me deeply. You know, Usain Bolt, a whole nother dimension. Um, there's so much to be said about us as a people. Dance hall, everybody want to learn a little dance hall and teach dance hall now. I meet people here in Bali from, you know, Eastern Bloc, Eastern Europe, and when them daughter they get pan, the Japanese, extraordinary. So we have a lot to offer. And so as I travel around the world, I see myself as an ambassador for the nation. Really, that's what it comes down to. You know, when I was growing up, what was important to my parents was providing an education for me. And absolutely that still makes sense. But beyond the education, what I would say is know thyself. Who you are, you probably know somewhere between the ages of zero and about seven years old. Get to know what your passions are, the things that you do naturally, the things that light you up. And trust yourself. Have confidence in yourself. Marcus Garvey talks about it, you know. In the absence of confidence, we're twice defeated. So develop yourself as a human being. Try not to chase material things because material things come and go. But the character, your integrity, is something that people will always feel and see as you meet them. The only limitation that you have on yourself is yourself. So, you know, I had no idea at 16, at 25, that I would be leading the life that I was leading now. But what I learned to do is to trust the process. And the only way you can do that is trusting yourself and connecting the dots. And there will come times where something you're doing might not make sense. But five, 10, 15 years down the road, you'll go, ah, this makes sense. When I joined the United Nations as a messenger, I had no idea that would transform into me doing yoga. And as I said earlier on, actually, it's not surprising. Because as a child, the two things I was passionate about was dancing and politics. I had a passion around politics as a 10-year-old that was not normal for a child of that age. So, you know, the fact that I'm an activist, a humanitarian, and a yoga teacher, amongst other things, is not surprising. So spend some time discovering yourself and try not to limit yourself. And I'm going to tell you something which, as Jamaicans, is a funny one because of the whole bad mind scenario. Sometimes keep your cards to yourself and just do what you have to do. The whole world don't need to know.